Hello, everyone, and welcome to the AFTD educational webinar, The Role of Creative Arts Therapy and Engagement in FTD Care. I'm Will Ryder, AFTD's Education Program Manager. On behalf of everyone at AFTD, thank you for joining us today. Uh, with full disclosure, I wanted to share with you that I started my career working with people with neurodegeneration as a music therapist. So I'm especially interested in hearing about creative arts, art therapy, and music therapy today. Before I introduce our guest presenters, just a few housekeeping items. You should note that our audience is muted for the duration of the presentation, and this will help to keep the background noise to a minimum so that we can all hear the presenters clearly. But if you have any technical issues, know that you can write a message in the questions box and we will try to assist you. Additionally, there will be time for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. So please type your questions in the question box as you think of them. And I encourage you to not wait until the very end uh, so that we don't get a flurry of questions all at once but um, we will address as many questions as time permits. The, the webinar will also be recorded and archived on our YouTube page with all of our other educational webinars. And you can visit youtube.com backslash theaftd.org to find our webinar playlist. Next slide. So uh, before we get directly to the program, just a couple of brief AFTD updates. And first, we want to let you know to save the date for AFTD's 2022 Annual Education Conference, which will take place on Friday, uh, April 8th in Baltimore. It will also be live streamed online if you can't make it there in person. Uh, you should know that AFTD will ask that all in-person attendees show proof of vaccination. Next slide. World FTD Awareness Week concluded earlier this month. Uh, in addition to our usual awareness raising activities, including AFTD's Food for Thought campaign and New York Times PSAs, AFTD was proud to partner with our colleagues in World FTD United to help create the global conversation on FTD. And for that, the video project comprises dozens of user-created submissions from around the world, totaling over four hours of content. You can, if you missed it, you can still see it by visiting worldftdunited.net to watch the global conversation. Next slide. And just to give you a reminder, our website, theaftd.org, has a new and improved section entirely devoted to FTD and genetics. So I encourage you to visit it if you have any questions about the genetic causes of FTD, seeing a genetic counselor, or taking part in genetic testing. Next slide. So these are our three expert presenters for the day, and I'm going to introduce them all uh, at present. Deb Del Signor uh, is a board certified art therapist with over 20 years of experience practicing in elder care, including as director of an Alzheimer's care community. She was the art therapist facilitator of the Art in the Moment program at the Art Institute of Chicago, which is a world-class uh, museum. Uh, and she, she did that for nearly a decade and currently provides in-home art facilitation with individuals living with dementia. Our next presenter, Caitlin Hebb, is the Clinical Operations Manager for Med Rhythms Incorporated and serves on the board of the New England region of the American Music Therapy Association. She graduated from Berkeley College of Music with a degree in music therapy and received her fellowship 
in Neurologic Music Therapy from the Academy for Neurologic Music Therapy. And our final presenter, Melissa Yuva, is a certified dementia practitioner, certified Montessori dementia care professional, and expressive therapist. As a member of the Clear Guidance team, Melissa uses creative arts in her work with people with cognitive impairments, dementia, and mental health diagnoses. She previously worked as an early childhood educator and interned at an independent living center with older adults. So welcome to you all. Um, thank you for, for joining us and, and presenting on this you know, interesting and unique topic. But I'm now pleased to invite Del, De, Deb Del Senor to join us via camera to start us off. And again, that was Deborah Del Signor. Beautiful. <laughs> Thanks so much, Will. So hi, everyone. Um, it's such an honor and a pleasure to be here today. Um, thank you so much um, for inviting me to speak. And um, thank you to all of you who've come today. Um, so as Will said, I'm an art therapist and I've been practicing for um, over 20 years. And um, I've had a lot of experience working with folks with dementia and also a lot of folks specifically who have been living with frontal temporal dementia of the many um, uh, variants. So um, I'm here today just to talk to you a little bit about art therapy, what it is, um, what are some of the goals and benefits of that, how art therapy engages the brain, and therefore um, why and how um, art therapy might be a good fit for some people who um, have a diagnosis of frontal temporal dementia, um, and so we'll talk a little bit about those things. Um, I'll talk about some of the benefits and some of the goals that I might set. Um, and then along the way, I'm going to try to like sprinkle in some sort of stories and examples um, and um, how I use materials so that hopefully you can take some of those with you today. Um, and obviously at the end, there'll be time for question and answer at the very end of all of this. So next slide, please. Okay. so. Art therapy is a master's level integrative mental health and human services profession. Um, it takes place within a psychotherapeutic relationship. And art therapy uses active art making. Sometimes people wonder if um, you need to identify as an artist to participate in art therapy and you do not. Um, and so, but it does engage active art making, the creative process, and also um, we apply psychological theory to our, our work. It's sort of a, um, the degree is in basically psychology and the study of art making. Um, and then of course, human experience. It's really important to center the individual and center the groups of people that we work with as therapists. So next slide, please. Um, Art therapy supports um, personal and relational treatment goals, so um, we can address um, social aspects of life, um, and we can look at individuals and support individuals as well as support communities. Um, art therapy is um, used, generally speaking, to improve or address cognitive and sensor sensory motor functions, foster self um, self esteem, self awareness. Um, cultivate emotional resilience, and that's maybe by looking at emotions, um, tolerance of emotions, sort of exploring where our emotions are coming from. Um, the goal really is to really um, promote insight, um, enhance social skills, reduce and resolve conflicts and distress. A lot of times I get my referrals for folks um, who are in distress or are struggling. Um, and another piece of this is that um, a lot of my work um, and of some art therapists is using art as a way to um, address societal change. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, going forward. So I think the last thing I want to say before we, we switch slides is that um, the difference I would say and um, others have said too between an art therapist and an art facilitator, especially working within healthcare, is that um, 
and art therapists were sort of charged to work with individuals and communities to try to support and um, foster a change, a shift in well-being. We're addressing well-being and, um, and we want to sort of see and work with folks to, to see change in their lives. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so um, generally speaking, art therapy is comprised of three components and that is um, the art process or the making of art, which is the process, the, um, the art that is made, which we call the product, and the relationship um, between the therapist and the individual or the group. Since we're talking about um, dementia today and FTD in general specifically, and since that is around brain function changes, I wanted to um, kind of talk about first how art therapy intersects with the brain and what gets activated. So like I said before, we got the process and the products. So the process and the products that are created in art therapy they engage people and they are perceived through tactile haptics so that's through our touch um, visio, visual sensory sensory so through our eyes we use our eyes a lot um, um, but not necessary we can use any or all of these and also perceptual channels like how are we perceiving the materials how are we perceiving um, the processes and then we reflect on the process and the products, and we process them around affect. How, how was that experience, how did that experience affect your mood? What associations are coming to mind as you're engaging in the art? What meaning um, can you make of this experience? And then we do that also through cognitive and verbal channels. Um, engagement in art therapy it involves, if you've ever made art, which I'm, I'm assuming many of you have on this call today, um, it's mode, it's kinetic, it's sensory, it's visual, it's emotional, it's cognitive. Um, that's how we process um, our environments. And it also activates the corresponding neurophysiological processes and brain structures in our brain. Um, I'm pulling this from um, an art therapist with the last name of Loosebrink, and um, there's another art therapist named um, with the last name of Hints and Lisa Hints, and um, they created a basically a framework of conceptualizing art making, and it's called the Expressive Therapies Continuum. And through this Expressive Therapies Continuum, it gives me an art therapist sort of a framework through which to consider through art materials how people engage with them, what they're making, how they think about them, to really gain, to really assess how individuals are um, perceiving and engaging with the world around them. So working with folks who are experiencing dementia, it's a really valuable tool to really get an idea, not only for me as a therapist, but also for that individual. How, where is, where are you finding most comfort in processing and perceiving the world? And how might we kind of play around with that a little bit through materials? Next slide, please. So probably everybody on this call also knows this slide, so I'm not gonna spend too much time with this. Um, and so these are the com common symptoms of FTD. Obviously, there are so many different variants of FTD. Um, and within each variant, there is a multitude of individuals um, who are experiencing this, um, which includes how, so people's experience of FTD is very different from person to person. Um, obviously that has to do with how that person's particular brain is impacted, what kinds of reserves are there, how are they responding to this, but also how um, people's environments are in the moment, and I, and I take that part very seriously, um, as well as past experiences. Um, this diagnosis doesn't become a person's complete identity and complete experience. Um, People have lived lives um, and their identities, how they've been treated in our society, um, obviously intersectionality around oppressed um, identities also comes into play. And I, it's, I think it's really important that we keep all of this in mind when we're working with individuals. So the common um, symptoms, changes in personality, that's gonna be the mood, that's the temporal lobe, impairment or loss of speech, um, 
loss of interest, apathy, maybe indifference, compulsive or repetitive behavior, changes in movement through loss of body or muscle control, difficulty in planning, um, executive function is impacted. Obviously, that also impacts the um, people's experience engaging with materials and equipment and those types of things. So um, lack of empathy, disinhibition, um, hyperality is also something to really be mindful of when we have objects and items that people might um, want to put in their mouths. We have to be mindful around that. Um, hypersexuality, compulsive touching. Um, again, that's sort of that, that um, haptic, tactile stuff that I talked about before. Um, and then disinhibited, dis, in, disinhibited exploration of environment uh, when people are just kind of walking around. Um, next slide, please. Um, okay, so all of those symptoms I just named, and then there are substance symptoms. So my first step as an art therapist to, is to really think like, why are these symptoms emerging? Um, obviously the neurological piece is there. Um, this is a neurological um, event. This is a neurolog these are neurological changes, but we must also look at the environment. What is the physical environment? What is the social, emotional, psychological, and perceptual experience of the individual? What do relationships look like? How are relationships and being in relation to others impacted by this disease? And, and also like what needs are not being met? Um, I share with you on the corner here, this is Kitwood, um, Kitwood's flower of personhood. And essentially um, Tom Kitwood um, was someone who wrote a book in the 1990s, um, Reconsidering Dementia, which, um, had us really reconsider, really think about how personhood, the idea and the concept of personhood is sometimes um, taken away from individuals um, as diagnoses come to be or as people move through systems of care. So at the center of this is we all as human beings, not just folks with, with dementia, but we all need these components in our life to maintain and sustain a feeling and an understanding of personhood. So I think about all of these different things um, as I'm assessing um, and getting to know an individual. Um, okay, and we can go to the next slide. Okay, so as an art therapist, my approach um, is generally relational. I think it's really key that um, the person is centered. Um, I've said that maybe multiple times now. Um, and um, also I'm considering neurological and functional um, impacts. Um, and then what I wanna do is really trying to identify what we want to address through the arts and how do I best find the best um, material or medium or process for an individual to engage with. So my first step is to connect. I've definitely met with people who, who just looked at me straight in the eye and said, I don't know who you are. I don't know why you're here. Who are you? Um, I don't know. I don't really trust you. I don't know what you're trying to do here. And so really my first step is just to connect um, on a real person, human level. And as this begins to happen, we be, I begin to assess. I often use this espresso therapies continuum approach to really determine like what um, what are the primary symptoms, what are what's causing distress for an individual. Why would it, why was I called in to sort of support this person? Um, and um, obviously that can be done by talking directly to that person because that person is a wealth of knowledge, they know what's distressing them, um, but also talking to other people in their lives. Um, and then once that's assessed, then I begin to I begin to construct what that engagement would look like. I'm gonna consider what process, what experience would might benefit this person to have through the arts? What types of directives? What materials would might best elicit something um, that we're trying to get to? And then sort of supporting that person through that expression, and then we both will reflect. I said before that we reflect on an affective and a cognitive level. Um, how was that? What did you experience? What did it feel like? How might this shift? Um, we'll revise and adjust. Sometimes new goals need to be set. Do we meet an old goal? Let's move on to another goal. So um, next slide, please. Okay, um, so the goals generally, um, 
when working with folks that are living with this diagnosis, um, I, I think it needs to be clearly said that um, it's not a cure-based approach or it's not a cure-based cure goals. Um, and that includes this idea of trying to help a person adapt to um, an environment that might not be set up for them. Um, a lot of times we want people to try to look the way they used to look or act the way they used to look. We want to meet people where they're at and sort of um, um, just try to make living enjoyable, make living um, um, meaningful. Um, so some of the goals might be around communication. Um, so um, Sometimes I've, I've sat down with people and, and what is most important in the beginning when they have this diagnosis is how can I communicate now with people while I can communicate clearly um, that I love them, that I care about them, that, um, that they matter to me. Um, and so sometimes that comes forward through life review. Sometimes that comes, I've written lots of letters with people um, made art um, with people to help them communicate. Later on, communication might become more challenging, um, and it might be a communication of emotions. It might be a communication of, this is my anger, and instead of knocking over the TV, I'm going to, you know, I'm working with individuals to be like, where can, how can we get this anger out? Maybe it's a kinetic experience that we need through the materials. We also, I also, a goal might be an adaptive function. Um, sometimes it's common to, for, pe for people to have perseverative, um, perseverative uh, behaviors. Um, where's that coming from? Why is that necessary? Um, and if we can't get to the heart of that, then what are some alternative uh, measures instead of, um, there was a woman I worked with once and her perceptive behavior was to sit on the floor of her um, house and dig all the dirt and grime out of the floorboards. Um, and in time, there were lots of cuts and um, um, like injuries that were occurring. So trying to find an alternative outlet for that. Um, there's, we can do collage. I've done lots of decoupage with folks with lots of strips of paper. It's a repetitive process over and over again. Um, also with exploration of environment, um, how might we um, work with materials to help folks feel more grounded, um, to feel more um, aware and, and, and maybe be able to sit for longer periods of time? Or if that's not really what they want, then I don't know what's going on. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> um, then um, you know maybe it's just a body-based thing. Um, that was my alarm, Will. I'm right on time. <laughs> One more minute. Um, okay. So um, also, um, if people are finding themselves being very passive or like stuck, um, how might I feel like my goal as an art therapist to help folks find the uh, medium of their choice, the medium that allows them to enter the state of flow so they can get sort of lost in this process of making. Um, a lot of um, calming can happen during that process. Um, a lot of, I, I've, containing stories is really common. Um, I've worked with lots of folks where we wrote, write um, stories or draw pictures around people's um, lived experiences. They want to be the writer of their own story. Um, and um, yeah, and I think ultimately to like one last thing that again, that I'm really interested in is how might we utilize the arts with folks who are experiencing this to address maybe some of the care and systemic issues that we see in FTD care in um, like long-term care that isn't set up for them. Like how can we begin to use art to maybe um, share the lived experiences from the folks who are living that um, to the caregivers so that we can um, bridge that connection and um, uphold personhood. So. Oh, well, I think you're muted. I am. And can you hear me now? Yes. So thank you, Deb, for that really deep and comprehensive um, presentation on art therapy um, and its benefits for people with FTD and their, their families. Um, I, I know there's a question in the box that I'll pose at the end for all of the therapists about finding art therapists and probably music therapists. But um, I'm going to invite our next presenter on, and you'll return in a little bit. 
Um, so I'm gonna invite Caitlin to join us on screen and to present for us on neurologic music therapy. And I think probably you're ready for the next slide. Oh, there we go. There it is. <laughs> I wouldn't know where to begin with that last one. Um, okay, perfect. So yeah, that was that was wonderful. And I love hearing about the arts. Um, and I am excited to present on my scope, the practice that, that I do on a regular basis. So as Will said, my name is Caitlin Hebb. I am a neurologic music therapist fellow. And so my presentation, I'm gonna talk through first and foremost what that is, as well as the use of neurologic music therapy within the care for FTD. We can move on to the next slide. So I think it's important to start just to explain neurologic music therapy, what it is, and it's a specific model. Music therapy is a very broad field and there's a lot of music therapists that work with a variety of diagnoses a lot of within a lot of different settings and so neurologic music therapy is a specific model in the overall field of music therapy music largely as it became or music therapy as it became a field was largely began as a social science model with anecdotal evidence that of, of the impact that music can have on non-musical behaviors However, as we approached the 1990s, we were able to see through music cognition research and neuroscience, really the, the vast impact that music can have on a neuro level. And the science, and this science is really the basis for the development of neurologic music therapy. So it started you know, creating this paradigm shift of how we measure and determine the greatest impact that music can have. And so I do have, you know, kind of a, an overarching definition of neurologic music therapy from this neuroscience we were able to develop. It's the therapeutic application of music to cognitive sensory and motor dysfunctions that may occur due to a neurologic injury or disease of the human nervous system. So it is research-based. We have several treatment techniques that are evidence-based um, and really based on how music affects non-musical behaviors like speech and language, movement, and cognition. We can go to the next slide. There are two processes that I'd like to talk about, and this is what makes music such an impactful mechanism to use within the care for FTD. And the first is wide, widespread activation. So there's really no other stimulus on earth that we know that can engage our brains so globally like music. And if you think about it, when you're engaging in music, you're probably singing along, you might be moving to the beat, you might be remembering a special moment in time, or even analyzing certain elements of that musical piece. From a neural level, there are multiple areas in the brain involved when we engage with music. And widespread activation and, and not just how it can impact individual components of our brain, but how our brain is communicating with each other. Next slide. And through this widespread activation, we're able to aid in the second process, which I think is really exciting, and that's neuroplasticity. So if we consider genetics, as, they, they serve as a, a basic blueprint for our brain development. Experience modifies this blueprint by shaping those neural circuits. And I think musicians are actually a perfect example of how this happens. Music is the experience that you're engaging in. And musicians have been studied for, for decades. Um, this is actually kind of the research that led into how can we take you know, cognitive music research into clinical application, but musicians were a perfect model for training-induced training -induced brain plasticity because of their long-term intensive and dedicated training within the auditory domain. So that really helped us shape, now we know how music is impacting our brain and we can transfer that to clinical. Next slide. So keeping those processes in mind, we're here today to explore how we can harness and use the music within clinical practice. But I would like to keep a special focus too for those who are listening and maybe have who, who are living with FTD or, or have a loved one with FTD and how you can actually use music. I use it on a clinical basis, right? But how music is so accessible and, and free and, and you can 
you can get it in a lot of different ways. And so I wanna keep a focus too on how you can use music in your everyday lives. So these are some of the goal areas and I'm gonna talk, this is kind of my narrow scope of the of the the people that I, I treat and the domain, the, the areas that I tend to work in. Um, there are probably many more goal areas that you could focus on, but these really are kind of the areas that I work the most with. So that's with the sensory motor, working on motor control, motor planning, uh, walking, using music to improve walking. We also have cognition, whether that be arousal, attention, all the way to executive functioning, as well as speech and language. So expressive language or motor speech, areas of comprehension, um, as well as areas of voice, uh, which I think, which is, you know, is also an area of speech and language and overall communication. You'll see the interventions below that I had kind of brief, briefly talked about, this evidence-based practice. These are the interventions that I use. But what I think is important to know is just the impact that music can have on all of these processes, right? All of these, these goal areas. And so, next slide. The first area I wanna talk about is the sensory motor domain and how music can make an impact on this level or for this, this goal area. So you see the goals on, on the side of this slide. And I think the first mechanism that I wanna talk about that is deeply embedded in almost all of the work that I do is the use of a rhythmic stimulus or rhythm, or, or we can often say moving to the beat. And that's because this mechanism of rhythmic auditory entrainment, which basically means when you hear a rhythmic stimulus or a beat within a familiar song, your brain is able to process, listen, and then move to that rhythmic stimulus. And so they call that rhythmic entrainment. The external source is going and your body is moving at the same time. And so a lot of times this can happen at a very, very young age. It's, it even happens kind of below a, a conscious level of it. We have certain receptors within our, our spinal tract that actually receives this sensory information. So you don't actually have to be so cognitively aware of moving to the beat. It's just something that is innate in us. And so using that rhythm, you might actually experience this or have used this in your everyday life as well. If you go for walks, if you have gone for runs, you might turn on music and actually use the beat as a way to kind of help drive that movement. And in clinical practice, that's exactly what I do. So for individuals who may have, have difficulty whether that's the with their gait speed, they've slowed down. When you think about someone's gait speed and slowing down, that often takes away from their balance. They might have difficulties with symmetry or coordination. Also dexterity. So I'm talking a lot about walking, but it, this also translates to upper and lower extremities. So it could be within your hands, it could be within certain leg muscles. So when you pair this, uh, this with a rhythmic stimulus, then you can optimize the movement. And so in clinical practice, what this would look like is I would probably watch someone look at their movements. This is my guitar. <laughs> look at their movements. And I would, I would first find where their baseline is, right? From their baseline, I'm then going to use the music to create a therapeutic change. So do I want to use the music to increase the intensity of what, of what they're doing? If it's, let's say, bicep curls, and we wanna use music to help increase the specifically rhythm, increase the intensity of that and optimize that movement. It also could be, for example, um, within walking, I want to increase their cadence or their, the steps per minute that they're taking, which can help with their overall gait speed and balance. So if I'm going and I'm watching them walk, I'll get their baseline cadence. And from there, I might actually modify that cadence. I might go up five to 10%. And what we find is that individuals are able to, with this external source, walk a little bit faster. So I might play something as simple as,
probably nod your head, you can probably move along with this, right? It's pretty simple. And then there are really fun ways to scaffold and use music, whether that be recorded or live music, because of the salience that music has and the motivation, it often, oftentimes patients that I'm working with say that it feels easier. I'm not thinking so much about my walking or picking it apart. I'm really focused on just the beat and moving to the beat. So it creates this level of optimizing the movement while also enhancing the experience. So if you're watching this and you're thinking, how can I use, how could I use music? It could be as simple as finding music that has a really strong beat presence and creating a walking program and walking to that beat. Or maybe you're already currently exercising and you wanna add music as another layer. And I think it's just being mindful of picking what type of music you're using. So does it have a good beat? And is it creating the type of response I'm looking for? Maybe I need to go a little bit faster. Maybe I need to go a little bit slower to work on my strength. Um, and the, the other area or the other mechanism I'll talk about within this domain is auditory feedback. And so we've talked about the rhythm that's driving the movement, but we also can use things like instruments that give us auditory feedback, right? So for example, if you think about the piano, the piano has keys that kind of stretch across, and it's a great tool to use to isolate and work on finger dexterity. It also has certain weight to the keys, so you can work on it with strength or coordination. And so the great thing about the piano too is that it creates a sound and tells you that you've achieved that movement. You can do this with a lot of different instruments. So I play the guitar. The guitar is great for fine motor strength, as well as things like the ukulele. So if you're inclined and, and curious about learning music and engaging in that process, from just a purely motor perspective, engaging with an instrument can really help achieve a lot of these, these sensory motor goals. So the big, the, the synopsis of this is that when you pair motor with the rhythmic entrainment and the auditory feedback, you create this loop that really helps capitalize and improve areas like speed, strength, range of motion, and dexterity. Next slide. The second domain I'll talk about is speech, language, and voice. And this is a really, a really big uh, domain to cover, so I'm just going to give a few examples of what this looks like. But if you have difficulty with accessing language, um, and you know this being an area that I got to work a lot with individuals who have PPA, uh, with a group that I got to lead at, at MGH, which was fantastic. And what I saw was that individuals who have difficulty expressing and accessing language still had language intact through singing. And this, is, this has been noticed for quite some time. And again, it goes back to the idea of widespread activation. So when we think about engaging in, in singing, it's largely recruiting from the right hemisphere, from other hemispheres outside of that left hemisphere, that the expressive component, whether that be in your, your frontal lobe or the comprehension piece being in your temporal lobe. And so music has a way to recruit from the right hemisphere to help aid when there's damage within the left hemisphere. And what I think of is, is great about this is that we still have access to those words, right? So how can we use music on a regular basis, whether that be through simple intoned melodic phrases, or it could be through the use of familiar music that you might know and have known for your whole life. For example, uh, a very common one, right? If I was just saying, twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you, you would probably fill in the word are, because you know that it's there, it's repetitive. We've learned it since a very, very young age. And that is something that's so deeply embedded that it's easier to recruit. And it's paired with melody and rhythm, which helps time out and really optimize that function as well. The nice thing about music and um, for individuals who are also trying to kind of access language when they need it, if they're having difficulty finding words, is that 
this melody that we've also that we we create oftentimes in music particularly in western music but probably in other other types as well is that we have this musical expectation within a phrase so da 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 it's going to come back to that it resolves which helps us remember the information specifically for individuals who are trying to recruit language it helps us recruit that word that we're looking for so while that kind of pulls a little bit within the cognitive domain it's really kind of serving as a language function so the idea of using a catchy melody to help recruit language um, is, is very, very effective. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend using, if you're thinking about using music in this way, I wouldn't necessarily recommend something that is already associated, right? Might already be associated with something like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. I would maybe try to create a melody that is simple and easy to remember, but doesn't already have information attached to it so that when you go to use that melody, you're able to recruit that word a little bit quicker. And it's specifically built for that. All right, we are gonna move on next slide to cognition and I will close. So cognition is the, the third domain and this is an area that we can work on arousal, attention, um, problem solving, executive functioning. And the big takeaway from this is that rhythm and melody is an organizer. So when you engage in something like music training, and this is kind of building up to this, is that you're able to access certain levels of organization, problem solving, decision making within the music making process, specifically improvisation or composition, that you, you engage in and is much more of a salient process. Um, and so I'll close by saying that when you think about engaging in music training, there's a lot of components of cognition. It's a great stimulus to use, a great, uh, a great structure for the brain, a great activity, and recruits from multiple areas. So the big takeaway is engage in music. If you've thought about it, if you're curious about it, it doesn't matter the level, but it is, crucial and important. So with that, I will transfer back to you, Will. Well, thank you very much, Caitlin. I always appreciate a little bit guitar in my afternoons, so <laughs> that was very nice to hear you play. And I'll let you and Deb know that we've already got some questions in the queue uh, specific to art or music. Um, and so I'm holding off on them now, but we'll bring those up at the very end. So thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, and we'll see you soon. Our next presenter, uh, I'll invite Melissa to join us. And there she is. And uh, next slide for Melissa. And uh, take it away with uh, creative arts uh, using a number of modalities uh, to benefit people with FTD. Thank you, Will. It's an honor to be here today. Hello everyone, I'm Melissa Yuva, the Expressive Therapist at Clear Guidance based out of Needham, Massachusetts. I graduated from Lesley University's Expressive Therapy Program with a specialization in art therapy last spring, and I'm currently working towards licensure as an art therapist and mental health counselor. Today I'm going to be presenting on how creative art inspires expression and engagement for those living with FTD. Next slide. For this portion of the presentation, I will share some case examples. And for confidentiality purposes, I have changed the name of my clients and I've been given permission to use some of their responses and art within my presentation. I hope to provide examples of using creative arts as a way to connect, motivate, and engage those living with FTD. Following some of my scenarios, I will also be sharing some of the benefits that come along with the creative arts engagement and I'll provide a few recommendations for incorporating creativity into your own practice. Next slide. So as I shared a little bit about my background, I wanted to touch on my approach. My lens and practice is built off of a, a mesh, really, of a strength-based Montessori and person-centered approach. And when I boil it all down, really, it's important in my work to find and highlight the strengths of an individual 
and what people are still capable of doing of in a time when there's a lot of focus on some of the things that they are no longer capable of doing. While art therapy is the core of the work that I do, I often incorporate other modalities as needed in a way to connect with other people that's meaningful to them. Sometimes that includes some traditional modalities and other times non-traditional modalities, which you can see listed below here from visual arts to bibliotherapy. Many of these modalities complement each other very well. And in these next few slides, I'll show some examples of how I integrate them and incorporate them for an intermodal approach. Next slide. For Noah, I'm going to walk you through the sequence of his creative arts journey. Noah's presenting symptoms include cognitive and physical decline with a heightened sense of awareness around the decline, resulting in perseverating thoughts causing stress and anxiety, as well as signs of apathy, lack of interest, initiation, and motivation. Now, when I first met Noah, you know, he did not identify as an artist. And to work with him, I narrowed my focus of symptoms down through assessments, observations, team efforts with coworkers, family members, and with Noah himself. As I got to know him, I discovered that through all of Noah's hardships and life changes, he expressed a glimpse of interest for flowers, nature, seasonal changes, both visually and metaphorically. As we built trust in a therapeutic relationship, I expressed a genuine interest in his photography and it just hit the, we hit the ground running from there. Led to photos, uh, sharing photos, printing photos, creating photo albums. And this was a great way to appreciate and honor his creativity. It was a great way to create a visual timeline and representation of our time together. And it was also a wonderful way for him to share these albums with family members to connect with them on a level where he felt confident and where he felt that he had a purpose and a meaning. So to create a more hands-on experience, we brought in real flowers and we began by adoring them and admiring them and then arranging them out on the table to take photos of them. And as you can see in some of these pictures, and then we pressed them into a book. And this led to framed pressed flower creations, which Noah proudly displays around his home. Next slide. For Seth, I'm going to provide an example of a specific directive that I used during one of our virtual sessions. Seth's presenting symptoms include processing losses and changes in his environment, his relationships, and his cognitive and emotional functioning. Because of the, a lot of the sudden changes in his life and his cognitive impairment, Seth experienced uncertainties, disorientation, and high levels of stress. And so it was very important to me to find a way to allow Seth to be in the moment and to shift and regulate his nervous system. Whether that be for just a few minutes, for half of our time together the whole time, I would take whatever I could because I knew how much of an impact it would have on him. Our sessions began with conversations and journaling, many ways for him to externalize and process all of those internalized thoughts and feelings that were going on. And through active listening, to Seth throughout our sessions, it was very clear that family and nature was a huge part of his life. So in this particular session, I play, I started off by playing this little video clip, and I don't know if we have access to that today, um, but if we could, we can try and run it for just a few seconds. It may not, there we go. So you can get an idea of just the motion that was going, there's a little sound, and you can pause that. Thank you. And so I asked Seth to really just imagine that he was there in that moment. Uh, what were some of the sensations that he was experiencing? And he responded with the five senses. I see motion fluidity. I hear ripples. I smell crisp air. I feel smooth rocks. I taste fresh air. Following that, after we had this mindful warm up and a little way to be in the moment by using those five senses, I asked Seth to engage in a free write response. And oftentimes what I'm asking is just a stream of consciousness. So that can come from finished or unfinished sentences, that can come from lists or poetry, whatever feels best for that person in that moment. And I invite them to share as much or as little as they feel comfortable. Seth's response was, 
Funny how memories work. I can imagine sitting in my chair at the dinner table, watching the river. I am the youngest of five. Mom and dad run the show. Happiness. I didn't know anything else. Nature, a world to be experienced. Walk, smell, climb, return to family. When Seth gets the opportunity to reflect and revisit on his childhood, he often shares how powerful the process is and expresses how much he enjoys sharing these stories with someone else. Next slide. For Mary, I'm going to share how I would prepare for a virtual session and how I incorporated expression through movement and music. Mary's presenting symptoms included a lack of meaningful engagement and physical and verbal limitations. Her physical and verbal abilities varied on a day-to-day -day basis, and so it was really one of those things that I would try to really take it as it came. I couldn't really plan too much for the session in great detail. So this is why it's important in any session to have a plan and a backup plan and a backup plan for your backup plan. And so I like to keep my session structured. And for Mary, I would observe her engagement during the warm-up. Sometimes this was a gentle breathing exercise, and sometimes this looked like humming or singing a familiar tune, for example. I would observe her body language and response to the warm-up, and that was informative to me to get a, an idea of her baseline. And so what I would do is I would have some lists kind of set aside to try and match where she was in that moment. So there were more soothing playlists that I had and maybe some more upbeat music and playlists that I had that were based off of songs that she enjoyed. And sometimes I would mesh those together to try to get a little mixture of both or redirect or shift her, her baseline. So I incorporated props by having scarves and instruments readily available. The scarves added a sensory and, sensory and tactile experience and made movement more fun and colorful. So while I was on screen uh, with Mary, I would often move along to the music and she would sometimes mimic. Sometimes I would mirror some of the motions that she was doing on her end. And sometimes she would just sit holding it in her hand, enjoying this nice little visual show that she had going on in front of her. This happened also the same with instruments. I would demonstrate how instruments could be used along with the music that was playing, whether that was shaking along or tapping or rolling. And naturally, Mary would oftentimes tap along the rhythmic stimulus. She would tap along to the beat naturally uh, or shake and roll the instrument along to the music. Throughout many of my sessions, it was apparent that music and movement had an impact on Mary. She would smile, and that anxious toe tapping that I would notice when we would first start would gently tap along to the music by the end. Next slide. So based on many of my experiences, I have found that there are a lot of common benefits, and here's just a list of a few that I could really, that came to the top of my head. And what I think about it, what's really important is just this improved quality of life, right? Giving somebody purpose, meaning something to engage in. Next slide. So just a quick uh, review of just some suggestions and recommendations when incorporating any sort of expression is thinking about your approach. You wanna consider your environment. Just try to be mindful of distractions or noises that are going on or the space that you're creating in. Notice and pay attention to your own body language and how you're presenting the activity. For attunement, you wanna to attune to the individual or the group that you're working with. Try to match their baseline. Where are they in that moment and how can you take your ideas or directives and modify them to benefit them in that moment? And which leads me to uh, adjusting and adapting. Yes, sometimes this means that your wonderful directive that you spent all that time on just needs to be put aside for the moment and you need to meet that person where they're at. And that's okay. It's important to be flexible for this type of practice. And next slide is just a thank you. If you could go there. So thank you all for being here today. Again, it was an honor to be presenting. And I'll turn my microphone on. Thank you so much, Melissa, for even demonstrating uh, in, in a web-based way how communication and interaction 
you know, can happen uh, with color and music and art. Uh, I'm sure that's a, a great uh, way to get individuals' attention, but also engage, uh, you know, their cognition and their physical movement. So thanks for that demonstration. I'm going to invite our other uh, two speakers to join us again on camera. We have a, a number of really good questions. So I think um, I want to let our audience know we are uh, probably going to run a little bit over the five o'clock stop time, but I think all of our presenters were able to be with us a, a little bit. And, and when I say five o'clock, that's the Eastern time. Um, and so first off, I want to let you know that one of our uh, participants, attendees, uh, encouraged AFTD to turn this into a three-hour webinar with each of these modalities being covered more uh, in-depth and comprehensively. So we'll put that in our suggestion box. I think it's a nice statement for interest in what you offered. Um, I, I wanted to start off with, um, you know, it's common that people come to uh, art or music or creative arts engagement having no, having no experience with like being a musician or a composer or a sculptor or a painter what what would you say about working with people that do have a, a background in one of those areas and and how how is it a benefit maybe how is it a challenge and what tends to work best I can speak to music, um, but I think that it oftentimes, from my experience, it actually can be beneficial. I think it's just in the therapeutic relationship, how you navigate that, how that relationship or that person's relationship to music. And so if someone was a piano player, um, and maybe that's a little bit sensitive because they are having difficulty with movement in their hands and they can't play it to the same proficiency that they once had, I think there's still ways to use music um, and maybe it's that you just don't start first on the piano. Maybe it's that you start somewhere else and and then eventually if you can start somewhere else and maybe work a little bit on fine motor and, and carry that over to the piano if they're open to it. Um, I think it could also be that you use piano music but not necessarily require them to play the piano. So there's lots of ways to engage in the music making process that doesn't necessarily have to be so specific on the skill that they they had. And um, I often will also say if someone is up for it, because I think on the flip side of that is that maybe they are motivated and they still want to engage in the piano in whatever capacity they can. And so in that way, it's just adapting the instrument and the expectations to use that instrument in a very different way, but still something they love. Great, great. So, so expanding on the things that interest them about that particular modality or activity, but not necessarily beginning in what they were an expert at. You know, um, Deb, why don't we bring you in in terms of art? What what has been your experience with someone who's an artist, if, if you've had that experience? Oh, I definitely have. So, I think I think all of what Caitlin just said really applies to art as well. Um, um it's interesting because i think a lot in a lot of in a lot of um examples that i have um people who have been artists in the past like making art especially if they haven't made it in a little bit of time there's a lot of changes that they see visually immediately in the process and sometimes the frustration with that is very hard to tolerate um and um other times like sort of so on one hand, people might be able to find that flow a little bit easier, but if there is, because it's a reminder of losses in some instances. Um, so I would say definitely like switching mediums, but also having conversations around, okay, like lots of things are changing. Even your art is changing. Let's see if we can sit with that. Like that's in a way, it's a it's a tangible representation of shifts that are happening cognitively and that gets expressed. And so, being able to be with the shifts in the making and in the products is actually could be a really growing like um, experience around acceptance and around um, just being feeling comfortable 
um, or like acceptance, or I don't know if that's the right word, but hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, and I, I'm sure Melissa, you'd have some comments for that, but I'm gonna move us on to another question because there were a number of people that um, were thinking of a, a, of a person with FTD in the later stage where maybe communication is, is really challenging or, or maybe they are no longer ambulating. Um, you know, how, to, how can you use the creative arts, music, art with a, a later stage person and really have a meaningful engagement? I don't mind touching on that. I think this reminds me of my connection with Mary, who really there was minimal verbal connection and we didn't really connect much, especially as we were on this virtual platform in that way. So it was really important for me to facilitate and to be very aware and mindful of the, the body language that was being presented and seeing how she was responding to certain things and getting a feel for that. So. You know, for example, I, I was no, making note when I was meeting with her of the tapping, maybe more some of the anxious tapping or her, her gesture of maybe looking away from the screen when we would first begin and how that would gradually shift and change over time. And certain things that I would do or certain music that I would play, her response would be informative of what to continue to try, um, maybe how to continue to change, you know, her mood or energy levels. But it, the body language and being able to pick up on that and being aware of it was very helpful in that. So that was that was a really great example. I also think in terms of music, um, one of the challenges or difficulties people with neurodegenerative diseases may feel is a loss of belonging or a loss of uh, being in a place that that makes sense to them. And I know that with music, uh, you know, music connects people to things that they remember. And with FTD, memory is often relatively intact late into the disease. Um, Deb, do you have any comments on, on art and late stage uh, activity? Yeah, so I think that, um, I again, I use this expressive therapies continuum regularly and sort of from a developmental level, um, um, at one level, one creative level is sensory and kinetic, and those are things that can be more passive or more experienced. So, like um, allowing people to explore their wor world through their senses. Um, I think a huge part of this for me when I first started out was kind of shifting, like what is art, <laughs> what is expression, and those kinds of things, and also like what our expectations are of what that is. Like I've worked with folks late stage who spent about. 40 minutes to make one line across the page and just that patience and no expectation that it's going to be like you know I think a lot of times too I think with FTD there's sort of this it's not a myth because for some people because you know the people become like um maybe you get really focused and can have like hyper realism in their art but later later on um you know I, I, again, like I'm remembering this woman that did this one line, and when she was done, she put her 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 paintbrush down and said, "You know what? You know, I realize now it wasn't my fault. It wasn't my fault." And she hadn't spoken in months, and that's all she said. And there was just a sense of like, whew. and so the it's not, it doesn't have to be about the product. Right, right, and 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 I I think that. Uh, the creative arts uh, are amazing for bringing out things in people that like communication or or emotional expression that hasn't been seen in a certain period of time, that it somehow accesses a different part of the brain. We're going to move on to another question, and this is a good one. So a couple of different people ask questions about, you know, how do you, how do you access, how do you find out about, um, you know, I, I guess are there national websites for music therapists and art therapists? And there's even a question about, does insurance cover this? And before you answer any of those, I just wanted to do a plug. AFTD has a quality of life granting program for persons with FTD. 
And that is a great option if, if a person with FTD or a family care partner is, is looking to pay for or subsidize some kind of creative arts activity, applying for that grant would be a great way to improve uh, the life of a person with FTD. So now back to all of you and how to find, how to find you folks and, and can you pay for it with insurance? I can I can start. Um, so you can find me well. Find me specifically by my email or, or um, Med Rhythms Therapy website. Uh, we are for as far as our practice, you know, music therapy is a field that is largely. I think most private practices are private pay. However, I will say that some within the field of neurologic music therapy, we do have CPT codes that we can bill under. Insurance companies don't necessarily. I will. It's it's a bit of a battle, but you're your best advocate. So if you if you are interested in reimbursement, we've had some individuals who have been successful in getting reimbursed directly from their insurance company. So I wouldn't necessarily count it out, and I think it's just a matter of how much you push um, for that. But so there, I would say there's a little bit of possibility, but largely um, our practice is private pay. But you can always reach out. We do have a national organization. Um, the Academy of Neurologic Music Therapy, as well as our National Organization for American Music Therapy Association, has a list of music therapists that um, have their specialties as well. Right, right. And how about art, art therapists and art therapy, Deb? What um, is is there a national association that might have that information? Yeah. <laughs> so there's the American Art Therapy Association, and they do have a directory. I was on it recently, and there aren't a whole lot of art therapists on it, but you can go there and see. Um, I know that I've been asked by a lot of um, dementia-specific organizations and associations in my area for my contact information, and so um, you might that might be a good place to go. Like, a, for instance, the Illinois chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. I know we're not talking about Alzheimer's here, but they have a list of um, creative arts therapists and counselors and stuff that um, people in the community could contact. And so that actually might be a great way to do it. Um, also, um, art therapists, um, if they're from an accredited program in the United States, pr predominantly all of them are counselors as well. And so we have counseling license as well. And so sometimes the obstacle with <laughs> counseling is, um, dementia isn't always covered in counseling because there's these assumptions and um, around people's capacity to engage, which of course is an issue. Um, so I guess those are, those are, that's my answer. <laughs> okay. Okay. And I just want to acknowledge, um, I, I know Mel Melissa talked about this a little, um, but some creative arts therapists are doing telehealth, telemedicine, uh, work and so even though you know uh melissa or or caitlin is in the boston area therapists do work and and deb is in the chicago area um therapists are uh doing those uh engagements and those therapies uh via the web uh when when possible um and i i think that certainly uh I would acknowledge that it, it would be especially hard for someone in a rural area, and I believe we even had a attendee that is asking about another country. So um, certainly those uh, lists from those associations could be helpful in getting you someone closer to you or at least learning about someone and uh, engaging with them uh, via telemedicine. Um, I think um, the last thing I'll ask of you is just to succinctly and quickly, because we're running out of time, we're over time, um, what's, what's one thing that you think music or art or creative arts is especially good at uh, in terms of uh, people with a cognitive impairment, in particular FTD? So anyone can go first. I'll go. Uh, creating those moments of joy. Mm. Which are so important. Um, and art, I think, accesses that and music accesses that in ways that just talk therapy or, or speaking may not. 
So uh, Deb or Caitlin? I, I'd say um, like connection. It's been like a really profound, authentic moments of connection that have occurred um, through people's art, whether it's sharing with other people or with with me um, or within their communities. It's really a powerful form of connection. Yeah, and I think sometimes art or music is sort of a non-judgmental way to connect around something and then that build on that connection. Um, and Caitlin, you will close us out with that question. I think um, I think it's just impact that it, as soon as you engage in in any of these arts and and you know I speak to music but as soon as you engage in any capacity in whatever way that you can it's going to create an impact for you on a personal level and and an impact for something even greater so well thank you for that thank thank all you all three of you for this you know unique and interesting and engaging presentation um uh we'll get back in touch with you when you're when we're ready to develop a three-hour program um but for now um we've had a really good appetizer about uh creative arts therapies so next slide we are going and please stay on camera with me while i do our next slide um and we close out um we we have a couple uh, webinars coming up and already scheduled. So in November, on Thursday, November 18th, from 12 to 1 Eastern time, we have Dr. Erica Pisch from UCSF, uh, an expert who specializes in physical therapy with those with neurologic disorders. And then we close out the year on December 16th from 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern time, uh, with an occupational therapist, Maureen O'Neill McGovern, uh, with Cognitive Concierge. Um, we hope you found today's program to be informative, and um, we will post a recording on our uh, website under News and Events. Let us know if you have any comments or questions, and be sure to visit our website, uh, theaftd.org, or don't forget our helpline at 1-866-507-7222. We'll go to the next slide and um, wishing you all uh, moments of joy with creativity and art and music. And thank you for joining us today. <laughs>